Hey there. Thanks for joining us. This podcast is put out into the world by Living Water Community Church, located in Ypsilanti, Michigan. I'm Pastor Clark Cothern. If you'd like to know more about Living Water, or if you'd like to drop us a note, or if you've got a question, or if you'd like to have us pray for you, head on over to lw-cc.org. Now, let's join today's podcast in progress. For some, this passage may be a little familiar. For others, it may be a brand new story. In either case, I'm confident, knowing that every time we look into God's Word, He has something very personal for each one of us. And I've been praying that this morning, that He'll speak to each one of us very practically, so that tomorrow we'll have something that we'll be armed with to go out into our world in whatever sphere of influence God takes you. Peter's miraculous escape, Acts chapter 12. we kind of in a, a two-parter setup for going through the book of 1 Peter. Last week, we talked about Peter's great denial, but fortunately, God was gracious enough that Jesus forgave Simon Peter, and he gave him a commissioning, saying, I want you to feed my sheep, become a shepherd. So he was becoming a fisherman shepherd. And so he started getting a, a new lease on life as he put all of his faith in Jesus Christ, and something switched within this guy. He was so fearful before, fearful enough that he denied Christ three times when people said, hey, you're, you're with him, aren't you? Out in the courtyard, around that charcoal fire. And yet something really switched in Simon Peter, and he became so bold as a spokesperson for Christ, as we're going to see today. Because in very short order, Simon Peter is put to the test. Because things are starting to ramp up. There's persecution. We don't know of any kind of persecution in America, do we? Well, maybe. Maybe a little bit. I think that what we're starting to see is that every time we look into God's Word, it becomes more practical and relevant than we thought it might have been. And it's becoming even more relevant in our day today. Uh, I meet with a bunch of pastors, and we share with one another. We're, we have some really good fellowship together, but we're praying for each other because we're people who know about the spiritual warfare that goes on, and, and we need to be bolstering one another. So we did that just this last Thursday, and I had read something that one of our elders had emailed. I had read it while I was even on my sabbatical about some opposition to a church that was getting started in the Ann Arbor area because this person who belonged to a certain people group thinks that the kind of things that this pastor is going to be teaching equates to hate speech because they disagree with what the Bible says about this particular people group. Now, that person, I don't think, has probably spoken at length with this pastor because if the person who brought that opposition met the pastor, she would find somebody who was gracious and loving and compassionate and welcoming and would say, please come, come and hear the truth spoken in a loving, compassionate manner because we believe God's gospel is for everybody. And it's based on God's love because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die in our place so that everyone who believes on his name can be saved. That's the kind of church I know this church is going to be. But there was opposition and we're feeling that more and more in America. We're reading more and more stories like that. Well, the good news is a lot of people were praying about that situation because they had not had their first service in that elementary school yet at the time that article came out. Turns out they had to have a hearing before the township not a single opposer showed up. Not one. People had just been bathed in that whole incident in prayer and saying, God, we just want your love to shine out in this community and we want to be salt and light. We, we don't want to water down the truth. We want to be truth speakers, but we want to do it in such a way that people can just sense God's love behind that truth. And then they had their first service and there was not a single picketer as had been promised, there was nobody outside with a picket sign. Nobody showed up in church to stand up and try to raise trouble. None of that. So fortunately, we're grateful to report that God is on the move. Amen. And his church will prevail. And we've known that to be true, even though we know as well, the Bible doesn't pull any punches on that. We're going to be hated because Christ was hated. And so sometimes just because we're believers, even if we're nice believers, even if we're trying to be loving to other people, some people are going to hate us just because we love Jesus Christ. That's just kind of part of being there. So that's preface to say this is even more relevant than we might have thought. 
because Peter was addressing the uh, letters that we're going to get into 1 Peter very soon, starting next week. Our elders did a great job introducing you to 2 Peter in uh, the month of August. But we're going to get into 1 Peter, and we're going to see why Peter was getting another really good dose of reality from Jesus about why we can trust his words written to us in 1 Peter because of this incident that we're going to look at today. So who is Simon Peter writing to? He's writing to believers who are beginning to feel the heat of persecution. How did he know about that? Because he encountered it firsthand. We encounter this kind of opposition. Some of you are going to be in college, and you're going to have professors who will grade you down because you quoted from the Bible or you quoted from some good Christian scholar like C.S. Lewis. Even if he helps make your point, you'll discover that there are various kinds of persecution that are starting to become felt more and more. On the job, some of us are going to feel wherever you may work, that you just kind of need to keep your mouth shut about certain topics because you're afraid that if you start talking openly about your faith, somebody's going to rat you out and they're going to say, he's trying to or she's trying to force their religion on me and they can't do that where we are. We're going to see lots more of this kind of things as the days grow a little bit darker, but we're looking forward to the time when Jesus is going to come again. And so it, he's going to make things right. There's going to be total judgment someday, but for now... We just are walking into this just like Simon Peter was. Things are just about the same today as they were when Simon Peter was writing. So we ought not to feel bad about it because it's been that way since the beginning of time. So yeah, we encounter that kind of opposition, but we've been singing about that. The battle is the Lord's. We need to just surround ourselves with Him. He inhabits the praise of His people. The more we continue to praise Him, the more strength He gives us. We saw that recent opposition with that church that was being spoken again by one opposer who wrote about it and was written about. A gracious response on the part of everybody concerned. And we saw how bold they were with grace. And I'm grateful to see that that happened. That happened to our church back in Adrian several years ago. Uh, I've shared this story before. I'll do the 30-second version. A guy came into our service because I think he was just trying to see how we would react to him. He was dressed like Merlin, the magician. He had a big, tall, pointy hat with stars and a half moon on it. He had a long robe. And when he walked, he was trying not to move his feet so that it looked like he was floating down the aisle. And he had a staff that had a crystal bound to the top with leather thongs. And one of the older guys in our back row turned to his wife and said, Oh, I think we're going to have a skit today. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody smiled at him and welcomed him graciously. <laughs> and he didn't raise trouble. He heard the truth. I spoke from God's word. He heard it. And then he stayed after and spoke with about four of us for 45 good minutes. It was a loving, wonderful, honest conversation about our beliefs and his beliefs. He was just there. And I was so proud of our church because I felt like we kind of passed a little bit of a test, so to speak. Rather than becoming fearful and overreacting or escalating something that didn't need to be escalated in the first place. And that's what I see happening when Simon Peter's heart gets switched after that wonderful um, commissioning that Christ does on the Sea of Galilee when he says, feed my sheep, something changed in Peter, and Peter was no longer fearful, And as we'll see. He's preparing Peter for writing the letters that we're going to start studying, 1 Peter, next week. I told you a story last week about how I gossiped badly about somebody in a sound studio that I'd done some part-time work in when I was in college, and how the owner of that studio took me out for the talk. And I realized after that that she was so gracious. She had done for me what Jesus did for Simon Peter. And I became a bold spokesperson for that sound studio. I started talking it up and talking about that wonderful woman who was so patient with the young people that were coming in to work for her. And I didn't have anything bad to say after that. And I saw such a connection with that 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 sort of has become my Simon Peter commissioning story that I keep for myself. I became bold in speaking positively Folks, we don't have to speak negatively about other people to carry the gospel. We can be positive gospel sharers. We can boldly share love and truth, and we don't have to take pot shots at other people or their beliefs. I think that something that I'm learning about this is that we don't have to shy away from it, but we don't have to be rude in how we share our faith. The buildup to Peter's miraculous escape is seen in the first few chapters of Acts. Acts 2, Peter has that great sermon. It's at Pentecost. 
People are speaking in other languages. Other people are hearing them. It was very clear that God was up to something. The Holy Spirit was being poured out in a very supernatural way. Because there were all these crazy things happening and it was early enough in the day, some people were saying, oh, they're drunk. And other people were saying, no, they're just filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a God thing. Peter grabbed that opportunity and gave this wonderful sermon. He, he gave a speech to all these people. The result, 3,000 people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ, and they were baptized that day. Then, Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they're ministering. He sees a guy that's been unable to walk since birth, and he's a beggar, and he's asking them for money. And Peter says, hey, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I do have is better than that. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. He heals him. Well, that creates a stir. So he uses that opportunity because a crowd has gathered so that he can share again. And he starts telling boldly. That's not the same Simon Peter that denied Christ in Caiaphas' courtyard. We see in the book of Acts that this is the whole new rock, Simon Peter. And then we see Acts 4, the first arrest. These guys are continuing to talk openly about Jesus Christ. Some of the leaders... The Jewish leaders didn't like that one bit. So some of the priests and even the chief priest and some others were gathering around. They had him arrested. And they were trying to threaten him into silence and saying, you don't talk about Jesus like that. And Peter, instead of saying, oh, okay, sorry, I don't want to have to go to jail. I'll, I'll shut up. Instead, he says, are you kidding me? How can I stop from singing your praise? I mean, how... How can I stop from talking about what I know? I mean, I've seen this with my own eyes. I know this Jesus, and I know he's real. You can't stop us from talking about that. That'd be like asking me to stop breathing, and I can't do that. So Peter boldly responds to that. Well, these guys are going, what do we do with this guy? I mean, it, we're trying to intimidate him, and he's not intimidated. What can we do? He was afraid of starting a riot, so they just wrote him a sternly worded letter. He just gave him a good talking to and said, just be better. Don't do this stuff anymore. And then he sent them off. Well, then we're seeing that it's starting to really escalate. And then we can start to see that there's a whole political shift happening because there's a new Herod in town. And this one was Herod, the grandson of Herod the Great and the nephew of Herod Antipas. And this Herod is shrewd enough that he's starting to realize that if I can blow with the political winds, it's expedient for me to side with the traditional Jews and to take pot shots against these Christians who are becoming Christian Jews. So he's thinking, I'm going to try to start ramping up my opposition to these Christians, these Jesus followers. And so things were getting bad politically, and a lot of people were starting to scatter as well. Peter says this wonderful, bold statement in response to having been arrested and told he's not supposed to seek. He goes, there's salvation in no one else, speaking about Jesus. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. We have that great verse. Well, that comes out of an opposition situation. And we can, you can just better believe this. You can take this to the bank. When you take a position, expect opposition. And as we, as believers, start taking a position in Christ or about what God's Word says about a subject, we know there are going to be people who will oppose our position. And that's okay. How are we going to respond to that? That's what we're looking at from Simon Peter today. That's when he says that wonderful thing. Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We can't stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. So then there's Herod Agrippa. He decided, I'm going to have James killed. Now, this is not James, the half-brother of Jesus, who became the leader of the church of Jerusalem. This is one of the other of the main three Jameses that we read in the New Testament. This is James, the brother of John. You know, Peter, James, and John, kind of the inner circle the three closest disciples that were up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ, it's that James, the son of uh, Barjonas, or is it uh, Barajanus? There were a couple of different names depending on whether it's Greek or Hebrew. That, the sons of thunder, in other words. So these are the boisterous guys that would be hanging out, these fishermen that would probably toss each other around and arm wrestle and do the crazy things together. Peter knew him like a real brother, and Herod Agrippa had James killed by the sword, had him beheaded. And then he had Peter arrested a short time later. So what is Peter expecting to happen to him? If James has just been killed by the sword, and if Peter has been arrested and thrown into prison, what do you think is going to happen? He's thinking, well, as soon as we wake up tomorrow, we're going to be taken out and we're going to have a quick, swift, unfair trial. And I'm probably going to be next. 
So what happens to him? He calmly falls asleep in prison with 16 soldiers around him. The scriptures tell us that. They had four squads of four soldiers, 16 of them. He wasn't taking chances with this guy. And at night, he was chained, one soldier on his right, one on his left. He's chained to these guys, and all the rest of these guys are out guarding the gate to the exit. And that's where we're going to pick up the story in Acts 12, 6. So we see that there's an angel who comes to Peter and wakes him up. Doesn't wake up the guards, he just wakes up Peter. And he's going, Peter, hey, Peter, wake up. Peter's like, what? How can you be so asleep when you think you might get up and have to go through a trial and be beheaded the next day? It's because you have confidence in the one who is your strength, knowing that no matter what happens to him, he's okay. That's a different Simon Peter than the one that we met by that fire in the courtyard. So he wakes up, but he's still kind of delirious, and he's thinking, you know how you're half asleep, the alarm goes off, and you're half in a dream, and you're thinking, am I dreaming still, or is that really my alarm? Was I dreaming that's the alarm? Is that really coffee I smell, or am I smelling coffee in my dream? Most of the time, I'm smelling coffee in my dream because I just smell coffee all the time. (laughs) But Peter is kind of in a stupor, and, and the angel has to get specific in his directions. Put on your clothes, Peter. You know, Put your sandals on. Come on, follow me. This way. No, this way. And he looks down, and the shackles just go clunk, clunk, and they fall right off the wrists because he's attached to these guards. And the angel leads him out past the guards, through the gate, and it's after Peter gets through that gate. You're thinking, oh, that was real. Delayed response. Peter's going, I thought maybe I was dreaming for a second there. This is really good. This is even better than a dream. I'm actually free, and I'm outside. So then he's got to figure out where to go. So he goes to uh, the house of Mary. It's got this people that have been doing ministry together for a long time. And they've got these situations where there's a gate in the wall on the outside of this compound. And he's banging on the gate. He's banging on the door to this gate. And he goes to Mary's house. And Rhoda, the servant girl, comes. And she looks out. And she's peeking through the little lattice work in the gate. And she sees him. And what's her response? She runs back in. She doesn't open the gate. And she runs back in. She goes, Simon Peter is standing outside. He's here. He's outside the gate. And what's their response? What have they been doing? They've been praying for Simon Peter. Dear Lord, as it's a Baptist prayer, we pray your will be done, whatever that will may be. We know you're probably not going to really answer the prayer the way we think it should be answered. But if you should answer that way, we'll give you the glory. You know, this, the man be pammy, we're, we're not really sure that God is able to do this kind of thing. But sometimes they wish something in their prayers, and then when he comes through, they fail to recognize that it was God answering the very thing they just asked him to do. And they say, we can't be Simon Peter. You think, folks, what were you just praying? And then, oh, maybe it's his his angel. Apparently, according to some scholars, there was sort of a prevalent thought back then that everybody has sort of a doppelganger or guardian angel that looks like you. My poor guardian angel. And, and so they were thinking that it was Peter's guardian angel, which means one of two things. Either the guardian angel is coming to share some information with them because Peter's still alive in prison, or Peter has already been executed and this is his angel coming to share the bad news or something. I mean, they just wouldn't wake up and say, look, it's God answering our prayer. So outside, Peter's still, still knocking away. He goes, hey, y'all. I know you're having a good prayer meeting in there, but I'm still here. Would you let me in, please? And so finally, Rhoda's response, okay, all right. So they get out there. And so finally, they let him in, and he explains all that's been going on. And, of course, they marvel at that. And then Peter takes off and goes somewhere else. We're not sure, but he goes off probably to hide because we still have to have common sense. I mean, you're not going to boldly walk back up to him and go, so, hey, (laughs) you were trying to kill me, but I've been set free. No, he goes and stay somewhere else until it's safe for a while longer. So here's a question, a little little parenthetical note about our prayers and our prayer life. This is about me too, because I find that I do this as well. Let's say that in your morning devotional, you're reading through the book of Mark, and you read Mark 12, 31, and you're saying, yeah, it says that I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. So God, that's my prayer for today. Help me to love my neighbor as myself. And what happens next? Very shortly after that, (laughs) And so you go outside the very next day, and there's that neighbor 
and she's struggling to change a tire on her car. It's that neighbor. The one who tends to talk a little bit too much, always about herself, and she's always got just a list, a, a list of things that she's going through that she wants to share with you, and you're almost late for work. It's that neighbor. And you have just prayed because you're reading that, Lord, help me to love my neighbor as myself. Do you think that maybe that could actually be the answer to your prayer? That maybe God is setting you up to say, ah, you prayed for this. But sometimes, kind of like Rhoda and the folks in the prayer meeting, he answers, but we don't recognize it as being the answer right away. And so we have to be in tune, put that little antenna up, listening for the Holy Spirit. Here's another one. You read Psalm 73, 28. How good it is to be near God. So you say, oh God, yes, I want that. I desire to be near you. And the very next thing that happens is you get a couple of phone calls and they're both people with horrible bad news. And you're just broken hearted. You think that could be an answer to your prayer? Well, and then you read in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the broken hearted. Sometimes God does answer our prayers and sometimes we just don't recognize it because we don't put two and two together and figure out that what he's doing just after our prayer is the answer to our prayer. And part of what he's doing is revealing his own character to us. Because as we get to know him better, we start to act out that character. And so we start to become Jesus to other people. I just met a guy yesterday. This was really incredible. Uh, a wonderful God moment for us. Uh, Joy and I went to do the memorial service for Jim Guy, Donna's husband who passed away last week. Zach is a state trooper. And he used to do traffic stops into the rest area where Donna and Jim kept the rest area. That was their job, was to keep the rest area clean and picked up and everything. And he did that because he knew that Jim would kind of keep eyes on him. And he'd have one extra person to sort of keep an eye on what's going on there and to call somebody else. Of course, he could call for a backup quickly too. But then he would process what's going on and he'd go in and talk with Jim about it. And he said Jim was to him kind of this wise grandfatherly type of person that would give him some good counsel and make him feel safe and make him feel appreciated. So Zach was there. He was there at the memorial service. We went to a Mexican food place afterwards for some supper. That was a real blessing. And we got there, and Zach sat next to me. So Joy and I got to meet Zach. And as it turns out, he's got a whole bunch of, of his trooper friends that are strong believers, and they pray all the time. And there are several of them that actually want to go into the ministry when they retire. So he was talking about seminary and Bible training and all kinds of neat stuff. So Zach is sharing some of the stories with us about what happens. He says, God has such a sense of humor, doesn't he? I said, yes, that's true. He said, for example, I'll wake up one morning and I'll be going, God, I really want to work on my patience today. Can you help me with my patience? And so what's the first person that I encounter on my shift that day? It's a heroin addict that's OD'd and I'm trying to help this person. And they're belligerent and they're trying to refuse the help that I'm doing to save their life. And then they throw up on themselves in the car on the way to the hospital. He says, God just has such a sense of humor. And he, he went through several other scenarios like that. But he understands that. What Zach was saying is what I'm trying to say with some of these examples about prayer. Sometimes our prayer life becomes a monologue rather than a dialogue. And we're just telling God, God, here's my list. And we just start doing it like he's Santa Claus. And we just rip the the page out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog and circled all the stuff we want for Christmas that year and we're handing it to him. And he's saying, you know, I think that maybe as a dialogical prayer life, you need to walk with me in such a way that when I answer, you start paying attention. And you wake up and say, oh, this is the answer to my prayer. I get it now. Lord, whatever it takes. I remember praying that prayer. I didn't know what I was praying at the time. I had a wayward son. He was drinking with his friends, binge drinking every weekend. He was really hanging out with the wrong crowd back then. And one time when he was gone and I didn't know where he was or how he would come back and what state he would come back, I went up to his room and I knelt down at his bedside and just bathed his room with prayer. And I was just begging God to do whatever it takes. I said, God, I know he loved you at one time. He probably still does, but he's so conflicted right now. But whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it takes... I just want you to draw him back to your own heart. I want him to walk with you. 
And it was a short time later when my son drove a car through a telephone pole at 100 miles an hour because he was blind drunk. You know what? You look back at that experience, God was answering my prayer. My son calls that his one-step program because it woke him up. He changed his routine. He changed colleges. He started going to a Christian university. He hung out with a different group of people. He changed friends. He admitted to us. He said, I didn't have a drinking problem. I had a friend problem. I needed to change friends. And after a year of real grief, because he went through a lot of consequences because of that lifestyle, but when he had started to come out the other side of that, he was a godly young man who was close to the brokenhearted and close to the Lord. And he's still walking with the Lord today. And so I say that personally to say that I know what it means to wonder, God, is that the answer to the prayer? Because it would be easy for me to say, that's not what I had in mind, Lord, when I prayed, whatever it takes. But God did answer my prayer. And it's a wonderful thing. He even says, I wouldn't have chosen to do that to get me where I am today, but because of the experiences I went through, I am the man I am today, thanks to the Lord. But meanwhile, back to Rhoda. He finally goes in. They tell her to go get Peter. He comes back in again. But we think, well, that's a great story. And it's so wonderful that we have this great story to show how God was protecting his own. The battle is the Lord's. Peter was saved. Yeah. Well, you know what happens to Peter later, right? And he was crucified for his beliefs. So we have to be careful how we talk about that. I heard somebody just not too long ago. He was a fairly well-known figure, and he was saying, well, if God is good and this happens in my life, then we'll move forward. And I thought, oh, but if he doesn't do that, does that mean God is no longer good? What about James? I mean, we read this at the very beginning of this passage that we're looking at. Herod had just had James' head cut off. Do we say, oh, well, God was good for Peter, but not so much for James? We have to be very cautious about trying to compare apples to apples like that. And I have a good theological answer for those who say, how do we know what God had in mind by not allowing James to be saved when he allowed Peter to be saved? I have a good answer for that. We don't know. We don't. We just don't know. Sometimes God allows that person to be healed from cancer with one chemo treatment and they're up and running for 50 more years, and then we see somebody else, and they're stricken with the very same type of cancer, and within six months, they're gone. Why is that? I don't know. I don't have a good, easy answer for you on that one. What I do know is that for the believer, God has his angels at the ready all the time, whether to usher us to safety or to usher us to home. Both are good. Both are good things. I prayed when our firstborn, Katie, was just a few weeks old and she got an unknown virus, a respiratory virus. She was fighting for her life, had a little oxygen tent in the hospital. She looked so feeble. And I prayed a dangerous prayer because I said, God, you know this little child even more than I do and you love her more than I can possibly fathom. And I don't want her to live through her life suffering. So if you are trying to spare her from suffering, if you need her to go home, she's your child. I trust you. As the father of this child, whatever you choose is okay with me. And in his case, in that specific situation, Katie was okay in a couple of days. And she's got my two grandkids in South Carolina. A little too far away, but we're working on that. But I've also walked through the valley of the shadow of death with parents that God didn't answer that way. And we can't say, well, God was good in our case. God's always good. And he's just as good to that family that's grieving because of that newborn that passed away or the stillbirth or a miscarriage. God is still just as good. And that's a mature believer's perspective when we understand that he's created us for eternity, not just for a few years. And I think we get really myopic and short-sighted if we're trying to make him answer our prayers in view of this tiny space of time. That's when we start to get selfish in the way we pray. Rather than thinking from a heavenly perspective, God, you know what's best for eternity. Do whatever you need to do for eternity in this situation, and I'm okay with your response. God's sovereign will is always the right answer to our prayer. Always. Let's pray together.
Father, this is kind of a heavy subject. And it's one that was difficult for me to tackle. Because I would like to be able to say, if you just have enough faith, God will protect you from all evil all the time. But we live in a fallen world. And because there are consequences because of the fall, and because that's not going to be made completely right again until the consummation of your plan, with the restoration of all that is good for those who are in Christ Jesus, we live in that between world. And so, Father, I pray that you'll give us that, that mature believer's view that would help us to take a strong grip on your grace and cling to you no matter what, saying God is good all the time. And you don't cease to be good just because a prayer doesn't go the way I think it ought to go, that you answer differently, because everything you're doing is for our ultimate eternal good. And so we want to trust you as our sovereign Savior. Thank you for doing that for us, for instilling faith. May we be more like Simon Peter after his restoration that we're not fearful anymore. We're not fearing what man can do to us. We don't want the praise of man, but we want only what's going to bring you glory. And I pray it in Jesus' name.